Welcome to Personal Landscapes. I'm your host, Brian Murdoch. You can find links for today's episode and other conversations on Books About Place at ryanmurdoch.com. Today I'm speaking with Rory McLean. Rory is the author of 15 books, including Berlin, Portrait of a City Through the Centuries, which is uh, one of my personal favorites, Stalin's Nose, uh, his story about a journey around Eastern Europe uh, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the the recent Pravda Haha, which takes uh, which retraces the that journey in reverse. Uh, here's what other writers have said about him. John Le Carre wrote that McLean must surely be the outstanding and most indefatigable travel writer of our time. And the great John Morris said, uh, he's creating a new kind of history in several dimensions and innumerable moods that adds up across the span of his books to a great and continuing work of literature. We have a, a wide ranging conversation about, uh, about the history of Berlin, about his time here during the seventies, making movies with David Bowie and about the, the state of Europe in general and where we might be going during these troubled times. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. Rory McLean, welcome to Personal Landscapes. Thank you, Ryan. Great to be here. It's great to uh, it's great to hear your voice. It seems like it seems like uh, ages since we were sitting at the fish having a cold beer on Savigny Platz. Oh. God, in Savini Platz, that was one of my favorite, Savini Platz was one of my favorite, favorite corners of Berlin from the earliest days when I first, first lived there in the 70s. When I was working with a, with David Bowie, he drops mm. within the first 15 seconds. I, I didn't mean to do that, but <laughs> it, oh, it that's was perfect because that's where I'd like to start with the, <laughs> with the Berlin years. But it's, uh, I had to actually, before I forget, I had some. I just saw saw the news today, or, or an update that uh, the fish. They, I told you they had an arson attack right at the start of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, uh, they've they've raised I, some funds, and I, I just saw an update from last month saying that they're they're planning to reopen soon. Like everybody's still employed, and right. so good new, good news on the beer drinking front. Good news. So so we will before too long. <laughs> once the, uh, the the lockdown eases, um, we can meet there. And yeah, I look great. forward. Perfect. To that. My favorite bar. <laughs> So that's during those. Did you live around there during those years? Um, I lived just further along up, up the road on Herrstrasse, mm-hmm. which, and then, you know, I first, well, I first stumbled into Berlin in in, um, in the early seventies. You know, I grew up in Toronto, and uh, me and uh, my friend Gord, mm-hmm. Gordon, Gord, we decided one summer that uh, that we would do Europe. I, I don't know. If I don't know if uh, our fellow Canadians still say that, but uh, but I just love the idea that you know the the sort of arrogance of the teenager that yeah what you're doing this summer, Gord? Well, I'm going to do Europe. <laughs> yeah. Do what to it exactly? But, yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, but then it's done, of course. So what are you doing next summer? I'm going to do Asia. <laughs> well, anyways, I started doing Europe in 1972, and I haven't really stopped. <laughs> mm. But but that was um, yeah, that was it was really it was a typical uh, how much old was it? seventeen eighteen um, a typical happy footloose summer doing everything that uh, that that young Canadians Americans Brits do you know climbing the Eiffel Tower tripping down the Spanish steps but um, but then and of course this this uh, young travelers can't do this anymore. On the last week of the holiday, I saw the Berlin Wall, mm. and you know this was 1972, something like that, 73. So Cold War, and you know that the the sight of that heinous barrier shook, shook me to the core. You know, there at the heart of civilized Europe, because of course that's why we we uh, we went left Canada for the summer because we wanted the civilization to experience the civilization of Europe. But there. In the middle of Berlin, between West and East Berlin, there were watchtowers, barbed wire, and border guards instructed to shoot their fellow citizens because they wanted to live under a different system. 
And it just shook me. You know, <laughs> once again, I say, it, I we are Canadian, and so it's, isn't it the longest unfortified border in the world, five thousand miles or something? And 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 here was a city, <laughs> or half a city, West Berlin, with um, with ninety nine miles of wall around it. Um, and and uh, it was such a key moment. <laughs> For me, because I knew the history, of course, I understood what had happened, but I couldn't conceive how it had happened, how individuals, um, how the actions of individuals had divided uh, Germany and Europe, the the wartime planners, the Soviet commissars, the Stasi agent, and they weren't monsters, they were ordinary men and women. Um, And how I, I, as I was standing there, I sort of began to wonder how they'd grown blind to their human experience and uh, and clouding it with dogma. And and I think it was when I saw that wall, I just longed to understand. It's, I didn't realize much of this till later, but I wanted to understand the motivation of those individuals, how they came to act as they did. Um, yet at the same time was repulsed by their crimes and, and needed to feel for the victim's suffering, you know, the, the few, the hundred. Well, this, this has marked quite a lot of your work, I think. And I see this uh, this thread running through several books. Um, I, I, I want to come back to that. But so you, yeah. what, this first trip, had you graduated from uh, Ryerson Film School at that point? No, no, no. I hadn't started at Ryerson. Ah. Or, no, it was it was first... Either I was just about to go into or had just finished first year. I, I can't. Mm. I'm not sure. That's I'm a long time ago. Um, but, yeah, at that, <clears throat> at that time, I aspired to be a filmmaker. Um, and, <laughs> and I worked in, in the movie world for, uh, for gosh, 20, 15, 18 years, something like that. I didn't realize it was that long. Yeah, well, maybe it, maybe I just I'm, off and on kind of thing, or was it continuous? Sorry, did again. it overlap with your writing? Well, yeah, well, yes, because because I because I wanted to be a, a film director, I thought nobody in their right mind is going to employ me unless I've got some sort of, if you like, uh, leverage. And so I thought, well, I, I'll write, a, I'll write a script, I'll write a great script, and then. Um, Hollywood will call up <laughs> and uh, they'll say, we, we, want, we want your script. And I'll say, you have to take me with it. Well, uh, the, uh, the idea may have been sound, but Hollywood never called. Uh, it, uh, but I ended up writing over the course, it's over the course of a decade. Um, so right from the beginning of making movies, I was writing scripts as well at working on movies as an assistant director and, it did any of them ever get filmed? Yeah, two of them did. Two of them did. One of them is uh, what brought me to Berlin. Um, uh, but but I ended up um, uh, teaching myself. So I, I would write. <laughs> I'd write a script, um, and uh, and at, the big mistake I made was I tried to chase trends. I didn't listen to myself, and so if romantic comedies were a big one year rom-coms then i'd write a rom-com if uh, and and submit it after <laughs> after the trend had passed and it was the same you know, action adventure oh, i wrote i'll write an action adventure and then nobody wanted it by the time um, i i submitted the script so what i would do is it, it, i was learning to write through this process especially learning how to set up scenes and handle dialogue and it, and create character through dialogue or, um, and uh, it, it, when the films were rejected, uh, the scripts were rejected, I went traveling and, uh, and realized I had such developed, had such passion for, for discovering the other, for, if you like, visiting, coming to know different societies, different places, and seeing how individuals there coped with life. <laughs> so, so how did your so how did your background in film then shape the way you write about plays? Does it shape Does it shape the way you see a story coming together, or how you conceive of this story? It it's it, yes, I think it's it means um, my my writing is very sparse. 
I think. Um, it has, uh, <laughs> it, it's meant that um, uh, I tend to structure my books in, in quite a, uh, a dramatic way, shall we say, or, or using um, dramatic devices. There's a, because all my background um, was in, uh, in, in filmmaking, going to film school, as you said, in Toronto, um, a, a lot of my cultural references come from the movies, and there's a John Ford, the great director oh, yes. of westerns in the uh, 40s and 50s and 60s. He said <laughs> to start a film, what I want is I want a horseman riding into town, <laughs> and I just love that image. You know, the horseman on his gallop, galloping into town, hell bent for leather, holding onto his hat as a white hat or black hat is he going to the sheriff's office or the okay corral and and that action draws um uh, draws the viewer uh, the reader into the story but but i have to say the the action can be character of course the character it can be dialogue um it can be a, it, it, it can be an exposition like that it doesn't have to be physical action it could be a but, pig falling on someone's head as well <laughs> <laughs> just a brilliant opening of your first book but i, I'll, I want to get to that shortly <laughs> but so i've got a lot of questions there well that's a so, bit of a so, tea. so back up a bit on. so we go back to the 70s first so how did you end up coming to berlin specifically to make films um well to make films that was uh so i was working i'd uh eased uh, i was splitting myself between canada and um and the uk and then berlin i was working for um a actor who aspired to be a director a man called david hemmings who was the uh, he, he was the, a, what close up was that the that's a blow up blow, blow up, up. He's, blow up. He's, yes yeah he's the david bailey character if you like in in antonioni's blow up Right. Um, and a uh, magnificent actor, really just, he could enter a character and bring even <laughs> its worst script to life, um, bring, bring a character to life. As a director, well, he, he, um, I, I think he didn't have all the skills that really make a fine director. But he was offered a chance to um, direct a film in, um, in Berlin. And uh, as his assistant in those days, I read all the scripts and I read the script and it was a derivative cabaret. It was uh, it was called Just a Gigolo. It was um, and it wasn't it was just about two years, two and a half years after Cabaret had come out. I thought, oh, uh, no, no, this is derivative. David, don't do it. And um, he took my advice until uh, the uh, the producer called up and said, "Oh, by the way, did we mention that David Bowie and Marlena Dietrich are in this picture?" <laughs> <laughs> and funnily enough, um, opinion changed. Uh, the script never really improved, but but there was this you know, gift. I was twenty years old, and this gift to suddenly be in West Berlin. So this would have been my second trip after the being a seventeen year old um, staring at the wall. Um, to be in in West Berlin working with um, David Bowie and Kim Novak, Maria Schell, Kurt Jurgens, it was just it that's was quite a change from Ryerson and, and Toronto. <laughs> it must be especially at twenty years old. Like how do you how do you cope with that? I suppose that you just take take what comes at that age, and you just think, oh yeah, I suppose. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I, I kept extensive diaries, and you know, and. Uh, <laughs> and when I was doing, and we'll get, I know, I know we're going to go to my Berlin book in due course, but when I was um, um, uh, researching the Berlin book, I went back to my original diaries I'd kept in 77, 78, and it would say things like, you know, Wednesday, uh, 3rd of February, um, uh, had, had went over to DB's uh, apartment on Hauptstrasse, David Bowie's apartment, had a nice talk about uh, creativity and listened to new tapes he'd been sent by Kraftwerk. Oh. And I've had this problem with my girlfriend, Sabina. And there, then there'd be a page and a half about Sabina and nothing else about David Bowie. And oh. 
Uh, so, so yeah, I don't know. This is the, uh, the, the arrogance of youth once again, perhaps. Well, priorities <laughs> at the time, I guess. Huh? Well, this, this, so let's talk about that. Like this, um, you've written this book, Berlin, Portrait of a City Through the Centuries. It's one of my favorite of your, it's probably my favorite of your books, as you know. Um, Thank you. And the, that section, when it gets to your time in Berlin, is especially vibrant. Obviously, it's drawn on, on strong memories of the time in these, um, in these diaries. Did, did you meet Marlena Dietrich as well? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But we actually um, she was living for, like in Paris or someplace at the time. But yeah, yeah, she was living on Avenue de Montagne in Paris, and she um, after about 1965, 67, she did that was her last tour of um, Germany because she was the highest paid uh, nightclub performer, not nightclub, the highest play, played um, singer um, performer in the world at the time, and she went back to Germany and. She uh, she was called a traitor, and uh, she was shouted at, and uh, and um, she said, "Well, I'm never coming back." And so she stayed in Paris, and uh, and it's a, a tragic end um, because because she was losing her German, and 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 so uh, she in the film Just a Gigolo, um, she has a couple of scenes with David Bowie, and we filmed. David Bowie in Berlin, but we had to move the whole set uh, and the crew um, to Paris to film uh, Dietrich. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I remember we were filming uh, we were filming her, and David Hemmings was feeding her her lines because um, they would only come together in the cutting room. And and so as Hemmings was feeding her her lines, she stopped in the middle and she looked at him and said. Do they pay you extra for this this shit? We learned this trick from um, Max Sennett, <laughs> the, you know, the nineteen thirties director, um, uh, and uh, she was not pleased because part of the reason, uh, a big part of the reason she'd agreed to play the role, her last perform sc screen role, was um, because she would uh, play alongside um, David Bowie, but they never in the end apart from in the cutting room it's a shame too because it's some of the scenes were filmed right in her old neighborhood yeah yeah yes yeah just right yes. around the corner from where she was born I, that's for, around where i lived last time about a block away from there so i'd, I'd cycle past there quite frequently yeah, yeah well the, the, she's the bridge that she stood on and watched you know the soldiers go off to war as a young girl yeah 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 that was her uh, part of town um uh, schoenberg kreuzberg uh, that was her part of town and um she only went back uh, to be buried. <laughs> she only went back. She is buried there. So the, the, in the book, you've you've uh, chosen to tell the story of Berlin through through twenty three people, like key key characters um, whose lives span, spanned five hundred years. And mm -hmm. I, I found it um, it was a really innovative way to bring the the city and its different phases to life. So, but maybe you could could you talk a bit about why you chose that method? How did you hit on that? Well. I'm, there's so many fine histories of Berlin and, and, and I wanted to write a history that uh, I guess if you like a new kind of history or a different kind of history, which um, uh, not just based on, on dry facts. And, and in my travel books, I learned uh, that the uh, simple parochial, parochial, <laughs> <laughs> representation, representation of a place was uh, no longer an achievement, but but what I felt was most valuable was the stories of um, of individuals, and uh, this is why Berlin is the Berlin, the city was so central to me because it it was it was really there that I started with asking this question about how could the wartime planners, the Soviet commissars, the Stasi agents, how could they have grown blind to their human experience? What, what was it? I wanted to understand them. Um, and, and so I began to realize that it's only by experiencing the world or imagining the world from a, another person's point of view that, that, that uh, I could or we can begin to understand that person or society. And I wanted to bridge the gap um, between what it what it, what it felt like to be that's the key word what it felt like to be alive in Berlin during the Nazi years or the Thirty Year War or under communism and uh, and for me that's that is most 
powerfully done through character and through the character evoking empathy. And, and then I suppose just a really important, really important point for me, just this, I'll just say this. And, and you know, this, there's a moral uh, point behind this. And that's how would I have behaved under the Nazis or communists you know, would, or uh, under any oppression? And that's why I end up writing about Burma or, or countries and people under, under, um, under some form of dictatorship. Uh, um, you know, would I have stood up for the victims? Um, or would I have said, no, no, in Berlin in 1938, no, no, don't take away my neighbor. Or uh, would I would I have had that courage, or or uh, would I have allowed my allied myself with the um, majority and gone with the flow and thought, oh no no I don't want to lose my job I I want my son to continue at school and uh, I don't want to be ostracized and and so that's a question I constantly <laughs> constantly um, almost constantly <laughs> ask myself certainly in all the books. Um, you know, it's uh, it's that's the moral question. Well, that's a key question, isn't it? Like, it, it, when it's all over, everybody was always in the resistance, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but at the time, like, yes, yes, I, I, and it's. I think too, like, you get so caught. You don't. We we know in hindsight where these events led, but the people the people at that time don't know this. So, like, you, you kind of have a feeling that things are going badly wrong, but it's just by stages. And yeah. you, you, what if what if this passes or what if this yeah. doesn't go all the way? So then I've, you know, I've sacrificed myself for nothing or I've made myself yeah. miserable for nothing. Like, I think we've learned uh, an awful lot of lessons from the 20th century. I hope we have. Uh, but, well, that's, <laughs> that's, that remains well, to be seen, but. You know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm, I'm in the, the UK at the moment, <laughs> the United, disunited kingdom. Um, I'm, and, and uh, of course, uh, the UK is dealing with the whole matter of Brexit, um, and and uh, and so of leaving the EU, leaving the European Union, and for me, the foundation of the EU was the memory is is the memory of war, but um, and what devastation that created. And so, yes, I agree with you in in Europe, in certainly in Germany, in in France, in in sort of uh, the most thinking, shall we say, parts of Europe, there is a, 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 a the lessons are still vivid. Uh, I think uh, the leaders <laughs> um, are, are still are willing to learn from the war, but, um, but the memory of war is fading. Uh, you know, the last, uh, the, mem- the memory of war is fading and certainly, and the, uh, Ambitious politicians, certainly in the UK and in the States, um, um, they're, they're taking advantage of that and uh, manipulating um, the truth um, to um, as, as the memory is forgetting. So I, I'd like to agree with you, Ryan, but it's not universal, I would say. Well, that, yeah, I'm, con- I'm concerned about the, the fate. Like those of us who grew up in the Cold War remember very well the divided Europe and that constant dread hanging over your head. I mean, I was... I was born in 72, the year you first came to Berlin, but I, not to uh, date you there, but I, but I remember, <laughs> I remember, I, I lived right on the border of the, of the US on the St. Lawrence. And I remember um, being constantly concerned that uh, the siren went off in our town one day, the, the, you know, one of those big alert sirens that spin on a giant pole. And I scared the shit out of us. Like I thought like this, this must be it. All the movies were about the cold war. The songs were about the cold war. Toronto in the in the sixties, um, there was a my best friend's father built a bomb shelter, a nuclear bomb shelter underneath his car, his uh, house. Um, where was he? Uh, where was the Forest Hill? I think uh, you know a, a bomb shelter. It's sort of inconceivable now. You think, wow! But that was a very real threat, and of course. My father, my mother, everyone I knew, their almost everyone I knew, their parents or their their dads had had fought or served in the Second World War, you know, and and helped to achieve that great moral victory. Um, and so it was so alive; it was one was so aware of the memory of war and the, the reality of it, the, the 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 possibility of it happening again. 
I think this this comes out a lot in your work, and I, I found something in a piece you wrote um, on cycling for uh, for Elementum. Uh, I, I want to oh, yes. quote this because it really touches on what we're talking about here. You wrote that people tell and retell themselves stories to shape their lives as nations do to shape their histories. I've understood that accounts of the past, both individual and collective, are created and used to mold both the present and the future. This is why I've come to see that all our histories, see all our histories as constructions, both because of the subjectivity of the experience and because the historical record is never complete. I, I like that description of memories, not as, as, you know, fixed and lifeless fragments, but as, as sort of an evolving dialogue between our past and present selves. That's a really nice insight. Uh, yeah, it's what I think and feel and, Probably it's it's come about because uh, because <laughs> seeing the Berlin Wall. <laughs> well, I don't think there's a and, city that expresses that so clearly as Berlin. I mean, you see it yeah. everywhere all around you. Like you. You've described Berlin as the capital of reinvention, for example. Yeah. So, so and, what do you mean by that for for those who haven't been here? So, well, uh, it, it just <laughs> it keeps it keeps reinventing itself. You know, it was um, uh, it, it was oh, in its earliest days. Uh, backwater and then it invented itself as a military cap the military capital of prussia um uh, and then it was a great cultural um capital as well as military under the um under, under the last kaiser and then it first world war devastation reinvention during the uh, between the wars when it became if you were had a bit of money it became this this place of of freedom and certainly sexual liberation, and then then along come the, the Nazis and change the story again, and it becomes this 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 uh, this evil <laughs> this evil city which is is uh, imposing attempting to impose its will on the um, on the rest of Europe, and and then Cold War it's divided it's two cities it's the uh, the Hauptstadt der DDR. It's the 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 uh, the idealized the eastern part, the idealized um, uh, socialist capital, and then the West Berlin. In when I first saw it in the seventies and uh, in the and in the eighties up till eighty nine, it was this outpost of capitalism. It was money was poured into it from Washington and from Bonn, the then capital of West Germany, to make it glitter <laughs> um, to make it look appealing and then of course uh divenda and re reunification and it's reinvented itself again as this this capital of uh, of can you believe it in the history of, of tolerance of inclusion of uh, embracing all the liberal values which uh for part of the last <laughs> five years or so have been under threat um, elsewhere in the world, it's a, a, been a remarkable, um, remarkable. Well, remarkable. It's, for a long time, it was also a symbol of that resistance, I guess, with you know the wall and this little enclave holding on just deep within the um, deep within the communist East. This this kind of last holdout, the symbolism of the Berlin airlift and all this stuff. Yes, and yeah, and it's very it's, it, it, I, that people quite a few people find that difficult to conceive because they. They probably know that Germany was divided for the Cold War and that Berlin was divided, but they don't appreciate that West Berlin, the Western half of Berlin, the, the Western allies sort of protectorate was deep within 90 miles inside East Germany. So it was surrounded, um, I think, at the height of the Cold War by a quarter of a million Soviet soldiers. <laughs> That's it's incredible. Um, I mean, I knew yeah. that from uh, MacGyver and and early '80s TV shows because always, yeah. always those adventure shows. You know, the hero would have to venture into East Berlin at some point and help someone escape <laughs> you know, in in some sort of crazy device. That and um, from stamps, I didn't. I wasn't like a stamp collector, but some elderly relative had given me you know a bag of stamps, and and I remember seeing DDR and Magyar and all these places. All the communist countries said, "What the hell is that all about?" So Berlin has also been um, a city or, or a place of reinvention, a place that, that individuals come to reinvent themselves, as well as, you know, the city constantly reinventing itself through um, through these phases that you mentioned and through the constant construction, actually, the endless renovation. Um, 
and, and David Bowie was a great example of somebody who came here to to kind of get a fresh start. But what is it that keeps you coming back over and over? Is it is it the um, the need to answer that fundamental question that you touched on on your first visit? Uh, yes, yes, but there's there's also um, yes, it's it's to answer that fundamental moral question, and it, because it, it was the place in the 20th century where it was Berlin was the place where the two great ideologies of the 20th century met. Um, and if you like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> that was the key uh, conflict for me. Um, but there's, uh, there's also, there's <laughs> a personal uh, link as well, be because I've been coming and going to Berlin. Oh God, can I do the maths? <laughs> So for almost 50 years, dear God, um, it's, it's quite a curious thing. Of course, every city we live in um, changes, every city, every town, every village, wherever one lives. Of course, it changes over time. But the, the changes in Berlin um, over the time I've known it uh, have been really profound. <laughs> Cold War. Um, the the falling of the wall, the, the the reinvention of Berlin as this new tolerant capital, capital of Europe, arguably, um, and 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 I've been there for many of those key moments. I just happened to be there, so it, it's so it, it's quite curious how the my it, you know. <laughs> I've had no, absolutely no effect on the history of Berlin. I'm not suggesting that for a second, but but my I was part of <laughs> I was there. My my small uh, experiences, you know, working with David Bowie, um, falling in love, uh, revisiting when as the wall was coming down, living there to write um, Berlin, imagine a city, or um, it's 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 like my story is part of that story and so uh it it's 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 quite it's very special <laughs> well, i guess you know, I, I can in your time I, here too i guess you've also you would have seen so many times where people have said i oh, just missed the heyday like everybody yeah. said it was better 10 years ago you're yeah you're too late yeah. that's how many times has that happened i wonder yeah well yeah but uh but you know, but I I try not to lose those moments. We forget the richness of our life, this one and only life we have. And so I still try to do it, like walking up Potsdamer Strasse or uh, uh, parts of uh, the uh, the um, uh, just at the Brandenburg Gate. When I try to remember every time I'm there, I try to remember that here was the wall. This was a really important moment of history. Um, and I happened to be here. I know here I went for a, a, a nice walk with uh, my girl, my wife to be, whatever. Um, and 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 I find that it's really it it helps. Maybe it helps me hang on to. Maybe in a way, Berlin helps me to keep my past life alive. <laughs> It, it's a, because it's so present because there are these important moments in history which one can't forget and oh my goodness i was there at that time i was doing that small thing then and so somehow they get linked um and and as you mentioned the buildings you know the changes are just phenomenal the first time i saw potsdamer uh, potsdamer platz it was uh, it was flattened it was a wasteland in 1972 and and then when I worked there with Bowie and Hemmings, it was uh, we shot near there, and it was still a wasteland. But then now, <laughs> of course, it's full of towers, and and it's it's uh, there's clubs there, um, and of course the best clubs were there during the um, during the uh, before Potsdamer Platz started to be um, rebuilt. <laughs> it's interesting the way a city like Berlin in particular is such a, a palimpsest of different you know layers of the past and different stories and then it's interesting how one's personal uh, story and personal past gets layered in uh, in amongst that certain cities seem yeah. to have that magic about them and I don't yeah. think every place does it's it's not it's not common 
So do you, do you think it's because of the changes, the extent of the change in the place? But I think it's partly because it's been the epicenter of everything, of everything right. significant in the 20th century, but it also, it shrugged it off. Like I remember reading that Hitler despised Berlin, hated the place, <laughs> wanted to bulldoze and remake it and didn't like the people at all because they just, uh, I guess it's it's the, the the famous attitude here that they just maybe weren't particularly impressed by the ranting Austrian. So, he, yeah. you know, he was, he was more at home someplace else and this was just someplace to be forcibly transformed. So it's, there's a feeling that it never really, it never really bought into all this nonsense, you know. Yeah, well, it was uh, historically, or certainly for the first, the first third of the twentieth um, century, it was red Berlin. It was very much um, uh, left leaning, even even communist leaning, um, and uh, of course the fascists uh, rubbed that out. Um, but then. Uh, of course, uh, half of Berlin and, and half of Germany were for from the late 40s until 1989 were, were communists. But it certainly doesn't feel like the rest of Germany, that's for sure. No. Well, this is, this is something I wanted to mention to you as well. This is um, about speaking of all things German from your, um, uh, this is from your first book, Stalin's Nose. I thought this was really perceptive. You wrote some. Um, Everything works in Austria and Germany. Signs direct, trains run on time, lights at crosswalks are obeyed. But these certainties have not been created for the, for the greater enjoyment of life. They exist for mindless operation. The, inher- the adherence to this extraordinary precision keeps the inner anarchy at bay. The German sphere is not foreigners, as, as it is the Russians, but that which is within themselves. They are an emotional people. They fear that, which, they fear that of which they are capable. So how did you how did you come to connect this obsession with with Ordnung with the past to the past in this way? I have a Swiss friend who who says, well, uh, most most uh, Berliners are um, are Slavs, <laughs> are are, and so um, uh, and and most of the Germans in the eastern part are are originally Slavic people. And so a much more emo- meaning meaning a much more emotional um, person, um, much more uh, susceptible <laughs> to uh, their emotions, much more influenced um, by their emotions. Um, how did I come to that observation? Um, well, my uh, <laughs> my my aunt, my aunt, who um, who's who's uh, plays a central role in that first book, um, Stalin's Nose. Uh, she was an Austrian, and and there was a bit of there was there's an anarchy about her. I don't, Ryan. I don't have a a straightforward answer to this. It's just it's just what I come to to see believe <laughs> and it really rings um, true because people wouldn't think of germans as emotional terribly emotional but the sense that it's it's a, it's a form of self-control of bottling a deliberate bottling up of you know maybe a, a slight fear of just letting the cork loose because who knows what will happen that that feeling of restraint that's very interesting yes and it, and it perhaps of course perhaps it may be a particularly post-war view um, because of the events that led to the Second I don't World know if War. That's entirely true, though, because the, like the scolding culture, for example, this the sense that if, if if everybody just keeps in line, you know, then then we can all just sort of, we can all sort of get along. But if one person doesn't, you know, jaywalks yeah. or something, you know, all hell will break loose. Yeah. But there, but there, but also, I think one must temper this with the um, the greater responsibility to the community. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That the the Germans have the uh, the certainly um, certainly the U.S. Um, uh, and certainly the U.K. now and to a lesser extent Canada. It's it's focus. The focus is on the individual. Germany. The focus is, I think, more on the collective, um, and so. Uh, and and that if that's come about for historical reasons, of course, because Germany for for ever, <laughs> arguably still, well, not uh, was surrounded by aggressors, 
um, you know, be them uh, Russia, uh, the Tsars, uh, Austria-Hungary, uh, Napoleon, all of whom have uh, have invaded Germany. And so the only way that Germany survived um, <laughs> to it, it was through through coming together. Germans survived was to coming together to protect the home, their homeland. Yeah, that's so, quite interesting uh, as well because the history is so confusing. I found like when I first started trying to read up on it, this this fractured place of all these principalities and duchies, and and so you could see how that sense of uh, group cohesion is necessary to hold that together. Yes. Yes, yes. And very, very, you know, <laughs> ask a Bavarian about a Berliner and oh, dear. <laughs> oh, I have. Yeah, that's, it's really funny. Like you, you ask people in other parts of Germany what they think of Berlin and they always say it's filthy. People don't follow the rules. Why do you want to live there? But geez, that's why I like it here. Like as a, yes, yes. As a Canadian or North American, I mean, this that scolding stuff just grates on me. But I like that kind of stuff because it's I take great delight, you know, in those clashes of culture where you just have two opposing worldviews and you think what in hell is going on and neither understands each other. And then comedy inevitably results. Yes. So I, I really like those kind of situations when you travel, it all gets sorted out in the end and you always have some funny insight, but, yes. but yes. the mess of it all really fascinates me. But I think the real problem that this place has, if I could, uh, if I could be so bold as to say is the pillows. Is the pillows, the square pillows. <laughs> those things are a crime against sleep. Did you have to use these? Well, well, no, I imported pillows. Yeah, so did I, uh, I learned my imported lesson. Imported bedding. <laughs> there we go. To-do list, moving to Berlin. So what does one need to take? Well, <laughs> oh, a proper food pillow. And, uh, and proper pillow. And, you know, I would say, well, I would say a double duvet. Yes. I yeah. <laughs> terms with the single duvets. You can get a double bed, no problem. But there's two duvets. See, it's got two single duvets. And Oh, I hate those. Yes, I, yeah. Or the oh, cavern and the said the bed pushed together thing. Yeah, <laughs> obviously it's, it's, it's we don't appreciate certain aspects of them, but uh, I, I I I travel with my double duvet. <laughs> I, I imported a pillow last time I went home. That's for sure. Those things are terrible. But I, yeah, I don't want to. I'll go on a rant if I get started. But uh, I want to. I wanted to come back to Stalin's nose though because. I wanted to ask you about fictional devices in in travel books. I'm sure that's a, a question you've often discussed. But when I when I first read the book, I was a bit I had I had to say I was a bit disappointed to learn that you had fictionalized things simply because like you you totally hooked me in and I didn't know until I got to the end and then I realized. But in other books where you said so upfront, I thought, oh yeah, that makes sense, it works. But in going back and rereading the book later on, I thought you know it really captured the strangeness of of post Cold War East confronting you know this, this, the West that they've been totally cut off from for so long. So I thought it worked actually really well, but could, could you speak a bit about that method, the pros and cons, you know, the ethics of it, how, how you see it? Well, I, how I see it is, is it, it, I have to make, I make a trip um, and a, a travel a trip like for Stalin's nose or, or for Berlin or for under the dragon. It's, it's, it's a it's a it's a trip meeting actual people taking extensive notes and that's an essential essential part of the process um and that for me that's usually a three to six months of course it was different for for the book berlin um <clears throat> excuse me um because i i was living there for the four or five years that took to write but for most of my quote unquote travel books i'll do a three to six month trip meeting actual people <laughs> um, and and then I will come home wherever home is and I'll sit down at my desk and if you like I'll I'll um, I'll begin a parallel journey I will reimagine the um, the the journey I, I, I will I will I will remember the journey I'll use my notes and I'll use fictional devices to Put it together in a way which evokes the most empathy from the reader. Once again, the, the purpose being so that the reader can then ima feel, imagine, be transported to Berlin in 1938 or Burma under the generals or an immigrant ship sailing from Scotland to Canada in the 1840s. That, so, so 
it's empathy again it's me, my desire for for evoking empathy through the characters in the reader so they will feel what it's what it's like so um so so that's it I, i'm reminded of the uh, uh, a wonderful quote by Thomas Macna Macaulay, the uh, historian. He said, quote, narrative history must be received by the imagination as well as by reason, not merely traced on the mind, but branded into it. And, and I get, I'd, I'd love that quote because it's, it, it's sort of what I'm trying to do. It reflects what I'm trying to do, which is to brand <laughs> history into the reader through characters. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, one of the reasons that the Berlin book works so well also because you you kind of bring these uh, different time periods to life, Ob time periods you obviously couldn't have witnessed, but you could you could attempt to reconstruct based on what you know of the city, what you know of that person's past and these kind of stories. But I mean, any, any narrative is shaped and created. We leave out the boring bits, the, you know, the, the tedious meals and Bus journey. Certain certain people come to stand. Three or four people might stand for one, or one person might stand for for three or four people, like a sort of conglomerate character that catches the spirit of that place. So, yes, I did that in in my book Magic Bus, uh, which uh, traced the Asia Overland Hippie Trail um, from from Western Europe to uh, to India to Kathmandu to De um, Delhi to Goa, and and my central character. Um, is based on three, uh, three, uh, three real women, three quote unquote hippie chicks who were about the same age when they did the trip in 1966, 1967. And, and I uh, interviewed them all. They, they knew I was writing a book. They knew my work um, and created a composite character. And you could argue that wasn't that it's not true. It's a fictional creation. But it's based the, the the character is based on real people who I I met on their real stories. I just combined them, made a composite. If you like, for me, it's 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 truer, and also it's 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 more <laughs> evocative. It draws the reader in. How prosaic would it be to say that Mary did this and Joan did this, and uh, it, that would be really tedious. In the end, it's a bit of a. It comes down to practicality as well. Like you, yeah, you, three different people say three interesting things related to the same subject, and you either have to introduce each one of them, give them a reason for being in the narrative, plot out their backstory a little bit. It just it's not very it's cumbersome. But if instead you can sort of um, mash these people together and, and create an archetype of, of of what they represent on a deeper level and what their what their story represents, I think that's yeah, it, it totally makes sense. Yes, but but um, but of course, if you like the more purist, uh, traditional travel writer who argues that uh, he or she is recording everything objectively, uh, that well, they wouldn't accept that. Um, but of course, I, I feel that it, all our experience is subjective. Um, but then then you ask the question about if you like moral side, you know, if you like what restrains me, and I feel a sincere well certainly a duty to the people i who i meet on the journeys often in the case of burma and and in the case of eastern europe right after the wall fell because one didn't know if if the wall would go back up again <laughs> if the soviet union would resurrect itself <clears throat> so the people i meet uh, often at risk to themselves i i feel well i i must honor them and their trust in me, I would never misrepresent them. Yeah, there's, I think as long as you stay true to the to the story and to what they what they actually represented and what they said, there's I don't see any anything wrong with telling it in the way you see fit or telling it in the way that's that um, you can best tell it. Yeah, and yes, well, there's another quotation. This time, William Golding, he says, uh, "quote unquote," courteous historians will generally concede. That since no one can describe events with perfect accuracy, written history is a branch of fiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. Well, it comes back to what to what we were saying in the beginning in your cycling article, how the we we construct stories to understand ourselves. But it's also like if 
the opposite, like on the polar ends of that, you either have complete fabrication or you have uh, tedious literalism, like an ethnography, you know, and I, I read anthropology at school and that stuff is, some of it's just unreadable. Like before you know it, you're making kinship charts and, and with symbols and consanguinity, which I still don't understand. So <laughs> it's, nobody but is yeah, ever going to read this stuff. Yeah. But this telling of stories, it, of course, it, it is absolutely key, the telling of stories. But I think politically, to take a step back, we, uh, we, we have this, we have a desire for clarity, of course. Um, but many politicians um, have, um, have equated that with oversimplification and they spin a story, um, certainly, uh, <laughs> certainly in the United States and in recent years and in, in Brexiting UK, um, they've created, they, they spin, politicians spring, spin an oversimplification and we fall because we're so busy, because we've equated clarity with simplifica simplification, we, we, uh, many of us fall for their simple soundbite answers. Um, and, uh, well, that's... I think that's a human failing in general. Like there, there's, there's a term for that. Is it the narrative fallacy or something like this? Where uh, I don't know that. that we, I right. think we, it's, it's a it's sort of a cognitive trap where we come to fall for, we fall for the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And in the right. same way, you know, we, the nations fall for the same stories that they want to tell themselves, whether they're true or not, like the yeah. constructive view of the world that you believe this is true until something happens to, to knock, knock you back a step. And then you have to kind of reformulate your story. But the danger in thinking that your story is the right one or that you really do understand the place means you, you just start seeing it only from that frame. And that's uh, politicians that they can pose this deliberately on people. Yes. Yes. You know, for their own ends. Well, that's actually, that brings us to the present and you're, Pravda Haha, your most recent book. So in in Stalin's Nose, you traveled through Eastern Europe right after the fall of the wall, and you know everything looked very hopeful. And uh, I remember that time very well. I saw I was watching much music, and they interrupted the the, the video stream when I was in high school and uh, showed the wall coming down. But you know, so much has changed since since then. And in and in the new book, you you made the same journey, but in reverse. So was. Was going backwards sort of an attempt to turn back time? Uh, God, I'd never thought of that. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, not, I don't mean like to to, to regress no. yourself to youth, or, or but I mean like to turn back some of these events from from where they are now to this more hopeful time, symbolically in a sense. Not to turn back, but but um, I, be, I feel that it has. It, in 1989, fall of the wall, it was such an optimistic time. Of course, it, this is an oversimplification. Um, there's complexities there. Well, it was it was a very optimistic time. It, it was a time, well, for some people who, who embraced communism, I guess it was a bleak time when, when things fell apart. But there was really a profound hope for the future. Like, Jesus, we can all be friends now. The borders are going to come down. We're all going to sing We Are the World. And everybody's, everybody's going to <laughs> embrace, you know, Western liberal democracy in the East. And the world would be transferred like the end of history you know fukuyama is the end of history yeah it, well it, it was such a euphoric time when i did the stalin's nose the first book trip it was so euphoric and of course you know i guess how could it be otherwise because because i and you had grown up in the shadow of world war ii with 60 million dead and half, half a million um and half a continent behind the wall so i think our generation um, or our generations are the response was to value individual liberty over tribalism um, and as you said to imagine the end of borders um, and uh, and so 30 years on retracing that first journey that Stalin's nose journey I was asking what went wrong you know what what went wrong what became of our faith in the power of openness and reconciliation um, and uh, why have so many? Why have so many of us fallen for the populists' spin, um, dragging democracy to a precarious moment? Mm. Uh, and that's that's the moment we're in now. And and I tried to explore this by by, uh, if, of course, revisiting a few places and finding uh, re reconnecting with people who uh, who I hadn't seen for thirty years, like a doctor in Warsaw who who. Uh, has, is now back on the streets uh, protesting against the, um, the, 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 Pol the Polish government. 
Um, and so, uh, so I did that, but, but also, uh, I suppose the, uh, the, the, the purpose, because, because I, I collect the stories, if you like the new national narratives, which are being spun to, um, to keep, uh, to keep citizens in line that, you know, they, Poland and hung, Hungary, they're, they're, they spin a line that they, their countries are threatened by huge migra- immigration, um, and uh, of course, that's the same for Brexit, and 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 it's it's uh, it's it's simply not true. They just spin uh, ambitious politicians spin these lines to uh, assure themselves of it coming into power or staying in power. And and so I I I wanted the uh, I suppose the moral purpose <laughs> of um, of Prada ha ha was the way I've put it together with stories. Um, so using fictional devices uh, was to encourage the reader to question all the stories that were being told. You know, make America great again. Britain is now free of Brussels. Um, and, and to learn, uh, <laughs> ideally, or to suggest that we should not accept them without question. Well, that, that was one of the things you wrote in the book, that Europe and Britain need a new story and a true story but you you also said um that the journey taught you europe is not a freak of geography a place bounded by ocean and urals but a question of culture and morality a matter of principles do you think the is eastern well is eastern europe still aligned with those principles are they reverting to type are they kind of drifting back into uh, an attitude that was hammered into them by the soviets because it doesn't on the one hand you know that's a long period of authoritarianism to try to overcome, uh, and when when things go become economically bleak, maybe they drift back into that. But at the same time, if you look at Eastern Eastern European civilization before communism, the you know the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the world that um, Paddy Lee Fermer touched on on his famous walk, you know, it's it, it wasn't that it wasn't this authoritarianism. I don't think it was a deeply cultured place. Yes, yes. Well, I would like to think it's a, um, a pendulum swing, and uh, I would like to think that uh, um, at this point under um, uh, Trump, I know Trump has, uh, well, I, he's no longer the president, um, but under uh, but Boris Johnson and Orban in in Hungary, I would I would like to think that we're sort of at the end of one swing of the pendulum, but but then there's there's another consideration which you you've alluded to, Ryan, and that that's uh, this was a story I told I can't remember if I included in Pravda, haha, but um, countries like um, Poland and Hungary they lived under. Uh, communism for only two for two generations, and so that meant most young people could still hear the stories of a grandparent who would say, "Oh well, this is what it was like before the communists came." But in countries like Ukraine, Belarus, Russia itself, they've had at least three generations under communism. And so the the family memory um, of a different life has been totally erased. And it, those countries, I think, because of that, it's much more difficult for younger people to imagine another way of life, a, a, a non-communist way of life. Yeah, that's a really good insight. I, I remember just being riveted by these stories of, of you know the old men of my town who fought in the war or... Um, traveling and meeting people in the former Yugoslavia, like the grandfather sitting in the corner uh, by the fireplace there, he had escaped the Nazis and he had this, once he opened up, he'd have this, this harrowing story to tell about escaping on a train, being shot in the leg, you know, and he's still going strong, but those, those, those memories get passed down between the, within the family. But yeah, what happens, what happens when those memories are, aren't there anymore? They fade away. It's very easy to forget. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, they, they, um, it was actually, I heard that in Estonia when I was researching Pravda Haha. Somebody told me the story that um, uh, 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 he, he's now a middle aged man um, and uh, actually a military officer. And, and he said as he was growing up in 
when Estonia was then part of the Soviet Union, um, suddenly uh, a uh, an individual was declared to be a great hero of the Soviet Union that he did achieve this during the the war. He stood up against the fascists and and um, and the uh, and uh, so he the the. Uh, the person I was speaking to was told this, the military man, as he was a child, was told this at school. And he came home and told his grandmother. And the grandmother said, what? Him? He was a petty thief. He was a real bastard. He stole from everyone. He, he exploited us all. And not at all. And, and so there's the importance of the grandmother or the grandfather the, bringing the actual knowledge <laughs> to stand up against the actual uh, against the uh, the myths which are perpetrated by the um, the regime of the moment. Well, the, the other thing that stood out to me too in your section on Estonia was the the very real fear that the Russians will come again. Like the people seem to have an eye on the east all the time and, and fully expect to be invaded again. Uh, totally, totally. This is the uh, um, the the uh, individual told me the stories, and he's part of the. Uh, um, he's a, a, a commander in, oh, I can't remember what the home army is called. Oh, gosh, that's not impressive. Um, but um, Estonian's an impossible language for me anyways. <laughs> for most of us, I think. But, uh, it, yeah, he, he totally expects, they, they totally expect that we're in due course that, uh, that Russia will, um, uh, will, <laughs> will invade again. And, uh, and it's if <laughs> President Putin or or whoever takes over from President Putin wanted to distract the uh, the country from from uh, from domestic issues, what better thing than to what better way than to stage a a, a little war? <laughs> well, it's certainly a plausible fear, given you know the Georgia and the Ukraine, what we've seen there. Yeah, recent decades. yeah, and, and of you know, of course, the uh, well, Estonia is part of the EU now, but but would would uh, would America uh, risk going to war with Russia if Russia if Russian soldiers marched into Estonia? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, unfortunately, not likely. Same. Yeah, and it's, and it's the same in Asia at the moment with uh, China's. Um, the um, uh, troubling, shall we say, of the or the claims on Taiwan. Yes, yeah, um, right. Yeah, would, yeah. Would would America risk going to war with China over Taiwan? That's, mm, it's, it, America is a. Uh, well, now we're getting right off the topic. <laughs> America is a, is a fading great empire. Yeah, it's it's certainly a a remarkable shift in recent years. But I mean. Perhaps it's a pendulum swinging back, as you said, or perhaps like uh, as the philosopher John Gray says, uh, history goes in cycles, and there is no linear progress apart from technology. But we remain fundamentally flawed as humans, and we just keep, you know, making the same mistakes over and over throughout history as technology evolves and <laughs> it gives us more powerful tools to make those mistakes. Yes. <laughs> so, actually, I wanted to before I forget, I wanted to ask you. At the time I read the book, um, why, how come you didn't include Riga or Vilnius in your trip, or in your, in, in the account of your trip? Uh, it was an oversight, uh, but also, it, it there are certain countries which that touch me, and often I can't explain why, uh, and often I can. <laughs> um, and the uh, of of. Uh, of course, there's rich, rich stories, but there. But I didn't write about Belarus either. Either I didn't write about former Yugoslavia. It's just, it's a big world, Ryan. <laughs> and I was just curious because I mean, you. I figured there were just better stories in that place, or you found a, you know, a better person to interpret that. The, yes, you know, it's it's, it's uh, when before I do a quote unquote travel book or like like. Um, I spend at least six months reading and researching and establishing contacts. But then when I travel, I don't, I, I, I try to leave myself open to chance. Um, and whatever, um, whatever uh, uh, people I meet, they might suggest that I could meet someone else and that will lead to a story. And um, so I, it's, it's an organic, it's a book, like a painting. It's, it's, 
uh, like a musical st- a score. It's it's an organic thing. It's a creation. It's a it it so it's it it has to be allowed a certain freedom to um, develop itself. Yeah, you have to follow the narrative for sure where the story leads. But the, so the longest section dealt with Russia. Um, was that a deliberate choice? Is it because like all the post wall problems that we're seeing come back to the USSR, or is it because just the you found such great stories there and such interesting people? Um, what so the chicken I, king was a great character. Oh yes, yes. Um, uh, is is it? Uh, uh, is it? I just I found very good stories there, and yeah, that's you've answered it. It's it's I perceive um, much of the many some of many some of the um, uh, the problems the challenges facing Europe um, have been manipulated or exacerbated I think by Russia by the Kremlin and and so I wanted to explore that I wanted to explore why had the Kremlin redoubled or why has the Kremlin redoubled its efforts to undermine European unity how did that serve Russia and, and and why has Russia moved away um, from um, from its its move towards democracy? Because before Yeltsin drank himself drank drank the country into the ground, um, there was in the early nineties um, there was a, a possibility of um, a more responsible almost liberal democracy in the country but uh they let it slip through their fingers or they let the powers that be uh take it away from them yeah, i remember that really clearly there did seem to be sort of a moment of of hope or change on the horizon and then it was like it, it didn't work out or it was people just got tired of the squalor that they ended up living in and somehow that dream just fell apart which obviously makes for a window. And it, there was also this sort of free for all capitalism seemed to go off the rails at that time to the point where the chicken King and people like this come in and then it's quickly yes. replaced by, you know, oligarchs and gangsters. Yeah. Yeah. So they, yes. they it, it was, a you know, embrace that free market spirit, but to, to just a crazy extent. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then the, the, uh, the oligarchs and the politicians, Came together in, into a, a mutual understanding, um, <clears throat> and, and it, yeah, it so seems like have... Russia has been acting as sort of an agent of chaos ever since. Just right? it's it's hard to figure an agenda, just to constantly disrupt the West. And, and... yes, but, but then that's uh, what's it? What's that uh, zero sum game? Hmm. Um, that uh, rather than uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, you try and improve your. Um, uh, the lot of uh, people at home, uh, but more important is to weaken and destabilize abroad, so the rest of Europe, the US, Canada, um, to some extent, so the difference won't be as striking between the quality of life uh, in the West and the quality of life in Russia. Um, and, and, and I think that's behind um why the Kremlin redoubled its efforts to undermine European unity, why well, you know about the, uh, uh, the, the Internet Research Agency and as it's so-called, uh, as it was so-called called, called, called and how it, it um, helped to uh, um, uh, it's, it's, it was constant act, the, the US election hacking, the, yeah. the Brexit yeah. hacking, uh, they seem to be involved in all of this. And you know, they, it, it's it really <laughs> they had to influence, or only a small number of people had to be influenced because of the nature of democracy, um, <clears throat> and that would swing the the vote the other way, as as we saw with Trumps coming into power in the states and in um, with Brexit. Um, you know, it's very so. Uh, I, so I think the reason why. The Kremlin redoubled its efforts to undermine um, the UK and the US and and Europe um, is so 
that it will, so there won't be as big a gap between it and the countries that surround it. Mm. Because of course, Russia, of course, have the, the historically, they have a enduring fear of invasion because they've been invaded so many times. Oh yeah, just yeah. just geographically as well. This is wide open on all sides. So, yes. the, so the, yeah, the, the need or the, the subconscious desire to keep a buffer zone um, between themselves and the, you know, through these flat open plains is uh, that's a real historical, it's based on real historical um, scars, I guess. Okay. So, yeah. so I want to draw back then as we, as we kind of wind down here to, to um, look at your, your, your work as a whole, in a sense, like you said, just to, just to kind of tie it up in a neat package here, if I can. <laughs> um, I'm not going to, okay. I'm not going to psychoanalyze or anything, <laughs> but you said, you've said that, um, cause I think that some key themes come out here that are interesting. Like you've said that several, several common themes appear throughout your work, um, individual responsibility, uh, the question of timidity and courage in the face of oppression, uh, a desire for, um, clarity and connection, uh, the flaws in, in memory, the desire to, uh, speak for those who can't speak for themselves. And I, I wonder if, um, Growing up in the '60s helped shape some of that. Like in in, in uh, an interview you did for um, for Magic Bus, the the story of the hippie trail, uh, you de- you described the '60s as uh, an age of amazing technological progress. Uh, everything seemed possible, all of which convinced young people that by changing themselves they could change the world. And that lucky post post war generation has had the chance to imagine a world without boundaries. They abandoned their parents and. Uh, postpone pleasure to catch hold of the living transparent transient world. They, they abandoned their parents need to, yeah, this, this putting off of, of pleasure to catch hold of this, this living and transient world. But it was like a hopeful, a vision of a hopeful world. that was very much summed up in the fall of the wall. So do you think the sixties, that sixties kind of childhood shaped uh, that, that desire or that, that hope to see this vision uh, come into reality in Europe? What Great question. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's true that that in the sixties that individuals believed that by changing themselves they could change the world. Um, I think we realize now that's a bit idealistic. I certainly, <laughs> certainly, uh, I'm not under any illusions that my books will in any way change the world. But uh, but I, I see them as. Um, a bridge building, I suppose. Uh, um, I see. I, I see. I'd like to answer it this way. I, I your question this way. I, I, I see myself as a conduit, if you like. I'm. I, I travel to places which are of interest to me, and I like to think of interest or importance to others, and I, I travel there again to enable the reader to empath- empathize, to understand what it's like to live in North Korea or in Burma under the generals or in, in Berlin and, and in, during the Cold War or, the, uh, or under the Nazis. And, and so I see myself as, a, as a, a conduit and I'm saying, so maybe it goes away from the 60s here. I'm not saying, uh, look at me, aren't I clever? Here I am in, Pyongyang or in Yangon, I'm saying, look with me, look with me, and look with me at this society, which is very interesting because of this aspect or that aspect or this individual or this person. I think I think there's also an element that you as an individual bring bring to this too, and it's something um, like your your feel for story and and uh, place, and it's something that I I related to as well. I have another quote here in the in the oatmeal arc. Your your story about um, about your family's background in Canada. Uh, you describe the main character as being made in exile by his father's failed hopes, and and you said that it led him to see the new world not as a place of fresh beginnings, a place for dreams come true, but a betrayal of those hopes. And it, huh. you know, it leads it leads the character to become a bit of an exile. But then at the same time, you say my roots were not in a landscape or even in a country, but rather in in my memories. So that feel for, you know, that I, I hate to use that cliche, but a global citizen, like the, the world is your, you know, the deep empathy with, with these places in general and these landscapes in general, but, but also with the, with the stories they tell and the memories they shape. 
I think that that really brings out something in your work. Sounds good to me. <laughs> I, you know, yes, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, pr- I'm proudly Canadian. I also hold a British passport, but uh, and I've seen myself as at times as a, a Londoner and as a Berliner. Berliner. Um, and I think overall, I would really like to be considered <laughs> a citizen of the world. <laughs> um, it feels a little idealistic at the moment, but well, no. But we take the we take those stories with us. I think, and that's that's like that's what beyond nationalisms, beyond these these petty conflicts. These are the things that we hang on to. You know, our narrative, uh, the stories of our past and our family, the things we've seen. You know, the things we've experienced. That's universal. Yeah, and in books. One can keep it alive. <laughs> you mm. can, to an extent, to a flawed human extent, you can keep hold of that one and only moment, that preciousness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, that's a great note to to wrap up on. I uh, just one final question: What are you what are you working on now? That like, can you share any any um, hints with us, or is it? Do you want to keep it under your hat? Uh, it's it's um, it's probably. Uh, a return to Berlin, in, uh, in but in a in once again in a different way, because <laughs> I like to think they're all a little different. <laughs> all the books. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, very much so. But they all capture this common theme that's really compelling. Oh, that's fantastic. So, where where can readers uh, or listeners find you online? What's the best place to follow your work? I, I guess through my uh, my website, which is uh, rorymclean dot com, and. Um, and the doorbell has just gone, Ryan. Okay, it's a perfect it's- perfect timing then. Well, thank you very much. It's always great to talk to you. And, and you too, Ryan. And we'll see you again in Berlin. Thanks for listening to this episode of Personal Landscapes. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes and subscribe through your favorite app. You can find links to today's podcast and more conversations on Books About Place at ryanmurdoch.com. You'll also find a donate button if you'd like to contribute to the costs of the show. All donations are greatly appreciated.